Well, hello, good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to see you all. We're so excited about all the street data gathering you've done since we last saw you. Um, we were just meeting before and like, oh my God, they're doing it. They're getting the work, they're getting the data. So excited to focus on that today, slow down a little bit with you all and kind of unpack what you learned, um, at least through one of the artifacts. I wanted to re-anchor you in the agreements as well and give you a chance to think about um, where you're at right now and kind of how you want to show up today, especially as you think about sharing some of this data from your students, which of these is feeling most important. And uh, you can just maybe jot it down for yourself. You don't have to share with the group. But consider what's my own intention around engaging in this, this work together this afternoon. All right, we wanted to begin a practice today that um, really comes from Indigenous communities that I've been privileged to work with here in BC um, called Calling Witnesses. And um, this is a way to invite a couple people in this community, Jamila will call one person per school, um, to really intentionally witness what's happening in the community of learning, um, to notice the ways that we're engaging with each other, our ways of being, our ways of talking about the data, um, and, and really going back a slide, how we try to inhabit some of these norms, right? So if you're called as a witness um, to be listening for and watching, but also feeling, um, the elders who really taught me about this protocol said, it's like you're listening and absorbing on a cellular level what's happening in the space. Um, so noticing where we are um, embodying this idea of centering students from the margins and allowing that to change us. Right, that's the purpose of the data that we don't just listen passively, but we allow it to change and inform our next moves, our orientation to everything we do, um, or places where we're really leaning in together and, and recognizing that we don't know everything as individuals, but together we know a lot. We have a lot of collective efficacy, right? When we bring our bring our intelligences, our wisdoms together. So um, with that in mind, I will invite you, Dr. J, to call a couple of witnesses. And those people, to be clear, at the end of the meeting, in our closing, will have a couple minutes each to share what they witnessed. Any observations? Awesome. Well, you all probably can tell him to call because I kind of previewed it when I said who was going to be here from each of your teams. So Aaron, come on down. You've won the prize of being a witness for Horace Mann today. Um, and as you heard from Shane, we just really want you to observe the, the space and then share at the end. And Winter, you too, will be uh, one of our witnesses today. We're excited to just see, you know, how you all absorb the things that you um, engage in today. And any questions about that, or if for some reason you can't do it when you're called, you can private message us, you can DM us and we'll, we'll reconfigure. So coming back to the equity transformation cycle, I'm actually going to save that until you introduce the protocol a little later. Um, we talked about this pretty quickly last time, and your homework was to step into that listening part of the cycle, which is where we always begin, deep listening at the margins of our classrooms, our communities, and doing that with the mindset of radical inclusion, right? And then today, we're going to slow ourselves down and practice this uncover piece. This is the piece that I think um, a lot of times we get stuck in the traps and tropes that Jamila writes about in chapter two, right? That we, we don't slow down or we kind of like make a quick snap judgment on the data and then maybe boomerang back to past practices or we grab the equity checklist. Okay, we're gonna do these three things and that'll make it all better. So today we're almost trying to like push back on solutionitis and just be with the data. Just be with what young people have to say when we listen to them, right? And then all of that is gearing us up toward the reimagined piece, which will start next week. We're meeting kind of close together in these two weeks to really think creatively about where this data starts to point us and maybe even build toward some co-design sessions with students. We won't do that next week, but we'll think about that next week and what that might look like um, so that finally we can try something. We can move um, some kind of small scale experiment, some kind of prototype, um, some kind of action with courage to do something different. So that's the cycle, as you probably recall, it's usually four six weeks, sometimes a little longer. Um, and we like to talk about it as safe to fail. So we're not trying to get it perfect, right? We're pushing back against the perfectionism piece of white supremacy culture, and we're just trying to be bold and experimental, but also really rooted in the experiences and voices of our students at the margins. Feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. So we thought it might be helpful to, to provide you with like a quick case study, kind of a balcony level case study of the cycle, like seeing it all the way through. And I think I had this on the agenda last time, but we decided to cut it because of time. 
to be transparent. <clears throat> and folks in BC probably know where Abbotsford is um, for our San Francisco colleagues. This is a district that's about an hour east of Vancouver, um, a district that is, um, you know, has about, I think, 20 to 25 percent Indigenous learners, First Nations students with a lot of equity challenges around that community of learners. Um, and they had like a, a big public critical incident last school year that came out. And I, I'm curious, actually, if the folks from Kelowna heard about this, if it spread to you. Yes, I see some nods. Um, and you'll see in a minute why, because it, it was on TikTok and there were like hundreds of thousands of viewers of the thing. So this is an example of starting the cycle through like an incident, right? Like a painful incident, which is sometimes how this starts. Um, at other times, it's more proactive, like you're going out and you're deciding this is a question I already have, I want to gather the data, but in this case, it's coming from an incident. So you'll kind of hear from the artifact I'm going to share what the equity center challenge or challenges were that the district needed to address, um, why it felt important and who was most impacted. And so we'll start with this adult street data. You'll hear two things, two, two adults in this situation, this is a system. So the first one is the mother. Um, who put the did the TikTok video? Who's talking about a piece of curriculum that was really hurtful and offensive and frankly racist? <laughs> and she's putting she's sharing that story on TikTok. And then the second one is the superintendent Kevin Godden, um, who's reflecting on what happened after this all kind of exploded and the choices that he and his team had to make about how they were going to move through it. Um, I don't want to say much more than that. Let's listen, give you a chance to respond to kind of what stands out to you, and then I'll make a couple points on the back end about it. Here we go. Right, at least five positive stories or facts about the residential schools from at least three different websites. I should have said before, I think everybody knows what residential schools are, certainly in Canada, but those are the, the uh, boarding schools, residential homes that Indigenous children were forcibly sent to and taken, you know, their culture was taken, language, oftentimes other things, and there was a lot of violence and abuse in those, so that's what she's referring to. Right, at least five positive stories or facts about the residential schools from at least three different websites. This is the homework that my daughter was sent home with in grade six from a school that is aware that she is Aboriginal. We are First Nations, we live in Canada, and this is what they're sending. They're whitewashing the rape of our culture the theft of our people and the genocide of just everything in general when it comes to First Nations people. They're not teaching them the truth. Five positive things about residential schools. Can you name five positive things about Nazis and the concentration camps? Can you name five positive things about slavery? This is not okay. Please share this and blow this up. This is what they're teaching your kids in school. We decided to look at this as a critical incident. Uh, our team, sadly, is practiced at crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, we took this one in no different uh, an approach in terms of how we mobilized ourselves to respond to it. I also spoke with her, and, and one of the first things I said to her was, uh, I'm not calling you to tell you to do anything but to use your voice. You're upset, mm -hmm. you have a right to be, and I want you to feel free to do that. I am not going to do anything to do that. What I'm actually calling to, uh, about was uh, a grave concern for you and your daughter about how you are feeling and if there's anything we can do. One of the other things I'll say is, um, you know, we're in, in, a, in a perfect world, we would have a non-Western way of dealing with this. Um, I think though the BC educators in the room will know that the people at the teacher regulation branch are humorless <laughs> and and have no interest in terms of looking at different ways for responding to this like so many of our indigenous elders wanted to to heal this but we had this very western policy driven way of dealing with what is misconduct 
that really kind of confounded us that we just had to play along because we have policies and the school act and and uh, uh, that we had to kind of uh, follow through, follow through on. We had to be brave. And so one of the big parts was having our one of our elders address our entire uh, uh, admin team, which is principals, vice principals, our operation ma management. So there were about 120 people strong. I called a meeting. And I think they they thought the meeting, the purpose of the meeting was, you know, to give the facts. But I, you know, we turned the meeting over to our elder and she was just graceful as the day is long. Uh, obviously, we couldn't record it, but I just, it was the most humbling thing to have her speak to us and give us hope that we could get through this, we will heal, we'll do it together. And uh, um, it, it, it uh, I think, gave some measure of hope and some sense of, uh, I'll say, courage to our principals and vice principals who are going to have to have conversations uh, because in every school this was being talked about and some people were afraid to you know, say, and, and so my big piece of advice was, create the space, have the conversation. We have a lot of work to do. And if, uh, you know, and we've done a lot of good work, but obviously it is not done. And we need to learn from this and move on. All right, I wanna give you a minute to um, choose one of these questions that speaks to you and stop and jot. And then we'll open it up for chat or unmute comments. So either just something that stood out to you from the incident or how the district responded, how what you noticed about how this leader and the system slowed down and got curious, right? That's the uncover part of the process. Um, what ways of being you heard or saw at play, or what is the instructional opportunity here if we go down to the classroom? So just choose one of those, jot, stop and jot for a moment, and then I'll open it up for some feedback. All right, I want to open it up if you want to share something in the chat, but also if you'd like to unmute and just share uh, an observation verbally, that would be fine too. I'm looking at page 173 in chapter eight. And, and you know, I was listening to it about ways of being and the instructional opportunity. And, you know, under perfectionism, the anecdote, the last anecdote, ask people to offer specific suggestions for how to do things differently. He did that. And, and along with that, um, the defensiveness, you know, to, uh, he didn't seem to have any defensiveness. He, he allowed the challenges to his leadership are healthy and protective productive in that power hoarding section. I mean, he, he asked for help and he appeared to be listening. And, and you know, I'm do, though I've said before, I'm doing work with the Episcopal church around, you know, repatriating slavery and how do we do that? And, and that's a big part is willingness and asking, what can I do? Cause I don't know, but asking. Yeah. And that's what that's what I heard him doing. Thank you. That's brilliant, Wendy. Thank you for going to the text, taking us to a specific part of the text to make um, that really important point and observation. Really appreciate that. Uh, let's hear from a couple more people. What stood out? What did you notice? What are the opportunities? Yeah, I'll jump in. Okay. I think it's really important that um, he invited in the voice of the elder um, to be a part of solution based moving forward and um that it was more healing as opposed to hurtful and yeah i just i can see that being learning on all levels not just teacher level but starting with all administrators and then bringing that forward to teens from there i thought that that was really great i thought um i thought it was interesting because he definitely highlighted policies and it definitely seemed that there's still a lot of limitations and he did genuinely i felt what i think was a lot of genuineness where there was a way he wanted to proceed but he was still held back by some of the western policies and then it, it begs the question how do you get past that you know what is the most appropriate way of dealing with that incident? And I, I do remember when that um, incident came to light and it kind of, it, 
yeah, it, it, it makes you wonder where, how do you remove those Western policies and limitations and move forward in a much better way. Yeah, it's a great observation. And I think we could kind of like map that same tension into the classroom, which I know, at least in SF, we were talking about that a couple of sessions ago, like, how do you transform instruction while there's still these constraints, right, of like standardized testing and benchmarks and all these kind of systems mandates that don't feel as liberating, right? How do we sit in that tension or paradox and keep moving toward what we know we want for our kids? Um, we probably have time for one more if anybody else wants to jump in. I was just gonna um, jump in and it's uh, all these good points taken, but um, I noticed he said we, we responded in crisis and I felt that that matched the level of emotion of the mom's concern because he did not minimize it. And yes, through a Western um, pedagogical and uh, mindset of our school structures, we all have emergency response and crisis re response protocols at the school. He could have um, made this about the mom overreacting. He did not. He, he, he said, this is a crisis and we need we need to respect and understand it as one. And so I I was really impressed by that. Um, it, also, along with what everyone else has said. Yeah, I love that. Um, I love that observation. It's making me think. Jimmy, love the quote from Dr. Kendi that we often share about how the difference between non-racist and anti-racist, and how oftentimes the the inclination is to locate the problem in the individual. Right. So Kevin could have easily been like, oh, this is just one angry parent. Right. Or it's one bad apple. That's oftentimes what happens too, right. This teacher is one bad, bad apple. And so we're just going to, you know, we're just going to get her out of the classroom and everything will be fine. <laughs> but I heard him take a much bigger picture, which is like, no, this is a systemic problem. There's this is just pulling the curtain on a lot of things we have to work on. And we're doing some good work and they are, but like we have more to do. Right. So really, really love that observation. Okay, I'm going to just um, kind of bring home a couple points from this and then we'll take this into your own artifacts, the same kind of process. So um, two questions that I think they really focused on in, in taking like an inquiry approach to the incident rather than just a solution approach, right? On the one hand, I heard them asking, how are we going to heal this in a way that speaks to our Indigenous community? So who, whatever group of students and families you are focused on in your inquiry, I think that's such a powerful frame. How are we going to shift this? Not just in a way that speaks to us, but in a way that speaks to the most impacted community we're trying to serve, right? And then on the other side, just teacher facing question is like, how are we gonna help teachers continue to be brave in doing this work? And, and Kevin didn't say this, but I felt in a way that like, if it was just all about shaming that one teacher, it was it would sort of like stop progress. Like they had to have a, a more transformative way to think about like this teacher needs to be, you know, to grow and be held accountable, but how to get people to keep taking risks and learning, right? And making mistakes and growing, like how to do that culturally. So those are two kind of inquiry questions. And we want you to be thinking about as you look at your data today, what are the emergent questions, right? To keep studying. And then um you know, if we think about sort of indigenous ways of being and Western ways of being, this is Chaz and Denise, who are two indigenous ed leaders in the province up here that I work with a lot. We built this table together. Um, I think we could see how, you know, Kevin was not looking for like the right answer so much as observing and listening, right? And the key component of relationships, relationships with the mom, with the elders, with um, the community versus like just trying to find a technical solution. Um, and then I think, you know, this is kind of the point that Elise made too, that emotionality was welcome. Like the level of emotion was not, they weren't trying to bury it, but really mirroring it or matching it versus oftentimes in Western ways of being or, or culture, like the emotion is seen as inappropriate, right? Or weak. We're not supposed to have feelings. So how do we actually not just allow, but really affirm the emotion that goes with this territory of trying to transform deep rooted inequities. So those are a couple of the things we wanted to lift up. Um, and then finally, just so you can see this all the way through, I actually got to uh, reach out to them more recently and ask like, what came of this? So if, if the cycle was really happening, then some things should have changed on the back end, right? It's not like you just 
have one meeting and everything's better. And they were able to quickly name five changes they made based on the learning. So number one, they established an indigenous education council. Um, and that's a formal governance structure with representatives from all the local First Nations communities. And what I thought was really interesting is that they have the board chair sit in on that council, but as a listener, not as a decision maker or policy member, like he or she comes just to listen. Um, number two, they built a conference called Walking Forward Together in the fall. Um, and it was just a day of learning about residential schools, about the history that was, you know, so disregarded in this curricular assignment so that um, all the elementary schools attended. Middle schools apparently could not because of the floods that were happening then. Um, and then they linked it to this larger provincial, you know, move around um, reconciliation. And this was really deep. So the teacher in this story actually put herself on leave after it happened because things were so volatile. I don't know for how long, but for several weeks. But then eventually she came back, she met with the mom, facilitated, and then she participated in a local First Nations longhouse ceremony where an elder told her story of surviving residential schools. And the teacher um, actually did service for the community. So there was a real healing that happened in a way that I frankly have never seen in the American context that happened out of something like this, very profound. Um, on the HR level, they created a new system-wide, what they call cultural safety training to really try to preemptively, you know, address some of these um, biases in the curriculum. And then finally, they um, hired a, a new position in the district called Indigenous Success Supporting Indigenous Pedagogy, a teacher focused on Indigenous-centered pedagogy. So a lot of systems change really flowed from just the ability to slow down and listen and behave, not just in these kind of um, colonial ways, but in more expansive ways of being. So you all got to ch a chance to see this go through with one system, and now we're gonna spend some time doing it with one of you all's clips. And I just wanna let you all know that I've gone through this protocol with a team of teachers before, and I have found this to be a pretty um, enlightening experience. I want to just uh, uh, name two tensions that are going to happen. Time is going to come up. We're going to have a lot of reflections that you are going to want to share. So I'm going to ask you to write at times and then be ready to share your thoughts. And sometimes I'll be able to get everybody. Sometimes I won't, but I'm going to try to go as quick when you're responding as possible. I'm going to give you time to think, but I, I, I'm going to try to go quickly um, to get you all, everybody's voices in. And then the second thing I wanted you to say at the wanted to say at the same time is that the uncover process is about 30% mind and 70% body and spirit. So when you're when you're with this data, I want you to kind of go back to the moment you're in with the student and not just think about what they said, right? But the feelings you had in the facial expression and all of those things and bring that energy in because that's what we're really gonna need. From the book, it says this, the critical mindset at this st stage <clears throat> is curiosity. Setting aside our preconceived notions, checking our confirmation biases and thinking hard before coming to any conclusions. As we study the data, we try to uncover patterns, hidden stories and misconceptions while maintaining a stance of wonder. What does the street data reveal and not reveal? What underlying patterns become visible? What more is there to this story? Uncovering root causes and hitting truth is such hard work. How do we retain what educational justice organizer Jitsu Brown calls ferocious humility? Recognizing how much we don't know. We stay curious. Curiosity helps us sharpen our brains to analyze street data with cognitive discipline to look and listen for deeper meaning. Hence the 30% mind, 70% body. We are going to have a few pieces to this protocol. Everybody's gonna be able to make a copy of it, but I will be taking notes in one room and Shane will be taking notes in the other room. And we're essentially going to figure out who's going to share. We're gonna share one clip. We're gonna observe all together and really just kind of jot down what stands out similar to what we did with Gia last time. And then we're gonna go through a structure of figuring out patterns and themes with what we see talk about our feelings, which is where the vulnerability piece comes out and start to set some priorities, I would call it, or next steps for reimagining. And for some of you all, you might say, I wanna go gather more data. And for some of you might end up in a different place. 
So that's essentially the protocol. Um, just one more thought on how you choose your groups when you go, I'm sorry, your artifact when you go. Um, there's a couple of things I want you all to filter through. Make sure whatever clip you choose for the group is a student at the margins. Make sure it's juicy. And when I say juicy, like we have some stuff to work with, you know, and what the, the student is sharing. So, you know, take that as, as you hear it, juicy. Um, maybe something that has a hidden narrative there, something that surprised you or an insight or something you didn't, you know, think you might get from it. And then something that is three minutes or less. Um, and you all did a pretty good job with that when you put together your clips. So that um, I think will be important as well. And though you hear me talking fast now, I'll be a little bit slower when we go through this protocol together. This is um, who is in grade eight. She has been with us since grade six and um, she was in my homeroom in grade six, so I do have a connection with her, which made her willing to be a little bit more vulnerable. <laughs> Has a hard story. In grade six, we started witnessing some abuse that was taking place at home. Some phone calls were made to ministry, but um, nothing came from them. In grade seven, during COVID, another phone call was made to ministry where some observations were made that it was unsafe in the conditions that she was living in and she's been placed since in foster care. You'll hear from her story that there's a lot of hurt, a lot of anger, um, a lot of trust. One of our indigenous students at our school um, with a variety of challenges. She enjoys being here, but um, she struggles being here at the same time as do many of our kiddos. So she was a great kiddo for us to lean into as our artifact. I want you to tell me about a time that you felt safe in our school. Um, I don't know, just being around like, just teachers that I know or that I'm comfortable with in general. It's not, it's not really like a certain time, it's just usually all the time. Like with Tina or you. And what makes those people kind of trustworthy in your mind? Well, because they, su like, they support me outside of school and I've, I, know, I know them for a long time. And we're just really close because um, my, my mom communicates with some of them and they're trying to figure out plans for me. Private chats and she just tries and helps outside of school like she'll sometimes bring me stuff or just try and figure out things for me that would help me outside um well i don't i don't really like more successful with my art than actual schoolwork because I don't really have the motivation to do any schoolwork. I don't know. I haven't had, I guess. I don't know. That's okay. It doesn't need to be necessarily academic, right? You could feel successful doing other things too. You are really strong in your, your artistic ability. Yeah, I, I think I succeed in art. Can you tell me about the relationship that you have with people in your classes or even around the school? Like, how do you? Well, I have, I don't really talk to my classmates, but I have like friends just in the school in general, just a few I talk to. Like, and can you tell me about a time that you maybe haven't felt that supported at our school? school called the ministry on me back in like a year ago. Well, they called the ministry on me because I wasn't with my mom at the time, but I was at a safe place. I was at my mom's friends because I wouldn't have been where I am now if they didn't take care of just mind their business. Where are you now? Lost your care. Yeah. I felt betrayed because even though I told them, I don't know, I just told them not to. I didn't do you feel safe when you come to our school? Yeah, I feel, I feel safe. Just, I don't know. The kids, like some of the kids.
Marks like good grades and kindness, but you don't really. I mean, you value it, but you don't do anything about it. I mean, you be, I mean the school's always being like y'all need to be kind and and stuff like that. But when it comes down to anybody or to the kids not being big faces, they don't really do nothing about it. So in this piece, I'm going to invite you to be as low inference as possible. So what are we hearing from the student? Um, what kind of most stood out? And it could be verbal or nonverbal data. The word betrayed came up. Body language. Very downcast, um, closed in, kind of huddled around herself. It's about as close to the fetal position as I think you could get kind of sitting in a chair hair kind of in the first part hair around the face right he says um you value kindness but you don't really do anything about it she likes that teachers still connect with mom how did you know that she likes that like what did you observe or hear that tells you that i think she when talking about um the adults that make her feel safe at home she mentioned that she like yeah and in with that so that there are adults that still connect with mom even though it doesn't get to connect with mom as much i suppose she did emphasize support outside the school so it seems important that it's not just within you know these walls it extends out into the community yeah like when she was mentioning that tina brings her thing mm -hmm. i thought it was interesting that she um kind of alluded to the fact that she doesn't She's not motivated, like academics aren't really, um, you know, priority. And then when Amanda asked, what do you value? The first thing she said was marks. I don't remember exactly what she said about art, but it seemed like there was yeah. a comment about art as a, as a strength, as a self-perceived strength. Does anybody yeah. remember how she said that? Yeah, I think she what she said was that, the question was, when do you feel successful at school? And she actually first said, I, I don't really feel successful at school, but like I'm good at art, but that doesn't really, I felt like she was alluding to like, that doesn't really count, you know, um, but she is talented that way. Yeah, her words were art more than actual schoolwork. So not even viewing art as schoolwork, maybe. This is a lot of good stuff. Anything else on the observation side before we kind of in, begin to interpret and analyze a little bit? I don't remember how she worded it, but she said, um, were the reason she was taken away. I don't, I forget the context of, but I think it'd be important to get the exact words for that. Do you recall, Amanda? I don't remember the exact wording. She, she said the school called the ministry on me about a year ago, um, which I just uh, noticed that the min called the ministry on her, not yeah. on her situation, but on her. And then she said, and that's why something like, and that's why I'm in this. And Amanda said, what? I also thought that it was interesting that we heard two things from her that were a little bit opposite. One being, I really value teachers that I have a relationship with like you and Tina. And on the flip side of that, um, that we should mind our own business. She said, if they had just minded their own business, I wouldn't be in this situation, right? But then on the flip side, lo loving that relationship, but yeah. And then for safety, she said, some kids don't make me feel safe. And it was because they're rude. And her connections in the building, she has friends outside of class, but doesn't seem that she connects with other students in class. I can't remember her wording about that, but she sees other students outside of class more than in class. I noted that too. I What I jotted to get her words was, um, I don't really talk to classmates, is what she said. 
All right, so what we're going to do now is shift from the observations into more of sort of analysis or uncovering. The question here is, what does this data reveal about the experiences of our students at the margins? In this case, a student, a student who's navigating foster care as a system. Um, what new questions does it surface? And I think what I'm going to do is push you guys into like a quick breakout, pair breakout because um, I feel like it'll it's kind of complex to sort through this. So everybody has access to the notes. They're in the chat right now. I'll push you into a pair share just for like four minutes. And the task I'd like you to take on is from that data to kind of cluster and see if you can come up with at least one, if not two sort of like patterns or themes that you see here, right? Um, you might also come up with another question. That's fine too. Maybe we'll say like, one pattern and one question or two patterns and one question okay all right welcome back i hope it felt helpful to have a moment to connect around this um heidi's going to put five minutes on so if each pair if one of you could just take a moment and kind of share what you talked about if there was a theme and or a question that emerged for you one of the patterns that we initially started talking about was the pattern of residential school being reinvented um, as the foster care. So one system kind of transferring to another is, is kind of her experience, it feels like. The other theme that we talked about and pattern um, that we see is building trust. And I feel that rebuilding trust every single day is, is kind of a pattern and a theme with um, so our big question about around that was how how do we rebuild trust um, in school so that she can really be in school when she's here because we feel as though when she is here like you said she has that protection of her hair around around her and she she's in her phone you know she's protecting herself a lot while she's here. The theme that we noticed was there's um, a good focus on outside of school. She talked about that quite a bit, mm -hmm. making this really short. And the question that we have, we, we talked a little bit about um, her, she's got so much going on, I think. We wondered how capable, like, can she actually, is there room in her brain to focus on anything inside of school when she has so much trauma that is taking up a large portion of her brain. So then our question was, how do we provide for her needs inside of school? I can go next. Um, Sarah and I spoke about uh, the theme of you, the school versus me. Um, and we also saw the theme that she does value connection with specific adults and peers. Um, but specific peers and specific adults. A question that we had, because she mentioned that she feels safe at school, um, and just knowing a little bit more about her situation, she noted the gathering room as a, a place that she feels safe. Um, so I guess a sub question could be, what makes the gathering room, or what places do you feel safe at school? Um, like what parts of the school make you feel safe and why? Some really great work, y'all. Some really powerful themes coming up here. Um, and I think hopefully you can feel in the process that there's, it's like a spiral of inquiry, right? <laughs> like it's more questions emerge as we get closer rather than like, yeah, oh, we have the solution. Let's just do this lesson plan. Like it's, it, this is deep work, right? So in, in that vein, let's take a moment, not 10 minutes, let's do maybe five or six, Heidi, for each person to just share like a feeling state. When you, when you listen, when you slow down and really take in um, this particular learner story and, and how she's feeling about school, like what comes up for you? I'll start. I feel like I have a little bit of solutionitis right now because I have so much desire to fix this. For It's been years of watching this route for her and the hurt and pain. It's hard. I'm also like a close adult with her in the building. And so, yeah, I feel a lot of things right now. I feel sad for her, but I also have solutionitis for sure. That <laughs> um, I also uh, feel 
I don't know if sad is the right word, um, but I'm really trying to be objective about what I heard and saw in her video and the larger story that I know about her as working with her in the school. So really trying to um, honor what her words actually were in the video. Um, and from that, um, I just kind of, you know, want to wrap around and just hold her up and protect her and, you know, give her what she needs. So, yeah. I think if I'm honest, I feel frustrated. Mm -hmm. I feel frustrated that we can't, oh, geez. I don't know how to help her and support her in when we have understandably people in the building that are frustrated with her behavior um, and the way that affects some of the culture of our school, to be honest, um, and how to, I don't, I don't know how to meet her needs in a school. Like if, if, if I didn't have to be her vice principal and worry about, I don't know, her going to class and not smoking weed and, and all the things, it would just be a really different story. I kind of feel that level of the conflict of you, you see what you witness in terms of the behavior and then you see the video and it's like you're sitting a fence between two different sides and you see both things going on. You have a definite understanding of where where she's coming from through that video but then the confliction is around well how do you move forward in terms of that behavior as as it presents in our building and i don't know just that word that she used betrayed is just like it, it's just like reverberating and res like our understanding as an adult did we do the right thing and in her, it seems in her mind, we did the absolute worst thing we could possible possibly do. So we're sitting back like, well, no, we're, we're looking out for kids best interest within a home. But, you know, did, did we do the right thing it was, you know, I don't know, conflicted. I also wrote conflicted. And it just like brings me back to our last staff meeting, the question was asked, like, are we prepared to falsify our beliefs about what good teaching is and I was thinking about that all through reading about being a warm demander like for a student like like what are we going to demand and do we still need to hold to what extent are we holding up um expectations and what are those expectations and why do we have them and all of the questions <laughs> Um, you know, I think I heard the word conflicted. I feel, I, I wrote down polarized. Um, even today, Heidi, myself, um, admin was working with and I'm polarized because I feel the pressure from staff. I want to wrap around her and hold her up like Winter said. And, you know, I walked into Heidi's office just now to get a piece of paper and it reeks of weed. So it's like, I don't know, I, it's a sense of helplessness. I just, I don't know how, yeah, I feel polarized. I feel polarized. Sorry, I just got kind of emotional. Okay. I think just thinking. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. Just, mm -hmm. just thinking what we can offer is just like patience, I think. So that, I was just like, what, what can I, what can I actually offer her as a person in her space? Just like my patience, I guess. So I think, yeah, sorry. Ooh. Anyways. <sighs> that hits me really hard dealing with a teen who's struggling, <laughs> you know, like, thank you for saying that because it's not linear. Kids who've had trauma or kids with mental health struggles and pain, like, it's not like we just find the thing that works, right? And something really, there's something very profound about just that, like, we're going to, we're going to keep showing up for you. 
you know, no matter how much weed you smoke <laughs> or how annoying your behavior is, like we're going to keep showing up for you because we believe in you and we'll hold you accountable and we'll have some expectations, but we're also not going to give up on you. It's like really powerful. Whew. All right. So I just appreciate that round, like both the vulnerability that you all shared and also just the range of feelings, right? Like just the human range back to Brene Brown and Atlas of the Heart, like we're kind of all over the place. You know, some of us are pulled towards solutionitis and like, how do I fix this? And I just want to make it better, right? And then there's sadness, there's frustration, there's a lot of just internal conflict. Like how do we manage staff expectations and school culture with like tending to and caring for this child and then this pull toward patience. Um, and I just want to say that when you do this on your own, it is so important to do this piece. Like this is this is the stuff, right? Like it's so easy to go, we don't really have time for the feelings, <laughs> but we have to be in this, we have to be in our feeling state around this, I think, to be able to get to new kinds of solutions. So thank you all for, for going there. Um, I'm going to be leaving in a few minutes. I'll start the round. And then I think Elise is going to, if you don't mind, take notes and kind of close this piece out. And so this is where we just kind of start to synthesize again, not like we have to come up with a solution, but really thinking out loud about like what matters about this data, right? Amanda, you chose this student for a particular reason. And my guess is she's maybe more extreme in some of the behaviors, but also like represent some underlying systemic things, right? So what matters to you? And there's a lot of questions here, but the two Jamil and I wanted to emphasize is where's our greatest opportunity for our growth and learning um, as a school and as a team coming out of this data? So I come from a social emotional learning background and the brain and really just like the very, at the very basic level, like safety is first, then connection and then problem solving. And I think in a school setting, we like expect our students to come into the classroom, like living at that problem solving level. And if they're not, there's a lot of frustration and like anger even at them for not being there. And teachers feel like they don't have the time to dig deeper into those other levels or in some cases like it's not even their job like my job is to teach and it's someone else's job to regulate um and so just as a school the opportunity to dig into that deeper and even just like sometimes I say like we celebrate that the student is even sitting in the chair right like that's the celebration today and we go from there um and I think that would maybe help to like pave the way for that patience piece that Lauren spoke of. Thanks, Sarah. I think for me in you speaking of that, it, for me, it paves the way to my own ignorance where you highlighted our assumptions that we expect all of our kids to show up with these tools ready to go. And she definitely presents the reality that that's not the case. And until you can understand where all of that is coming from, that's just my own ignorance kind of speaking that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes that are creating that kind of fight flight like you're speaking to in the brain of the safety part so yeah just I'm kind of highlighting my own ignorance about some conceptions or preconceived ideas you know we expect them to have the tools and they don't I think Shane when you said we you know Amanda and the team um, chose this video for a reason like, I just think of, I know that a big chunk of the staff is very frustrated with the behavior in this building. We know that. Um, and I would say the majority, if I'm just thinking about it, of the kids that we regularly see with the behavior that people are frustrated with are students that, Sarah, as you talk, like they're not at the problem solving because of many, many issues that are not under their control they have no control over mm -hmm. and so they come to school and they don't go to class and they're hanging out in the bathrooms and they're all the things that people are frustrated with right and we're expecting them to be in class and to be learning and they can't do it and and i i, I feel like we're just going to be banging our heads against the wall until we can i don't know what the solution is 
but we're just going to be banging our heads against the wall until we really get that. And I, I don't know what the solution is, but provides, believe them, believe, believe them. them that they can't do it. Right. Heidi, your comment feels like this pivot point toward the reimagine. Like when just listening to you, it's like, I'm just starting to see this space of imagination with the students, this like radical dream for what the school looks like that actually really wraps its arms around, holds these babies in ways that they don't feel held, that helps them begin to build some of those skills that they lack right now. Um, and so you don't need to jump to that, but that's what I could see listening to you. And you know, you have a couple more minutes before folks come, I think, but um, y'all are doing fantastic. I think Heidi, what you mentioned, like the can't and like the perception that it's like, I won't, like she won't do it, but it's like, no, she can't do it. And how do we be okay with that, I guess, or fit in that? And it's, it's like this seesaw that we live on. Like on one end, like you can't do it, honey. I know. And let's support you. And on the other side, just freaking go to class. Just go. Right. Like, and then, oh, right. They can't. And why are you in the bathrooms again? And, oh, they can't. Right. Like, and I was just reflecting on that so much. Sorry for getting so emotional. It just like hit me. It was like, what can I off? Like, cause I think about it so often when I'm just like sitting here and like, just like starts TikTok dancing and like gets everyone all riled up. And it's just exactly like, why are you here even then? Like get, get to class if you're just gonna dance here and throw everybody else off that wants to be working in here. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I love that analogy. It's totally a seesaw of just like that patience and then frustration and <laughs> patience, frustration. So yeah, that's the beautiful analogy. Um, I'm just looking at like the whole group reflection and I recognize that um, we should be thinking about and her situation, but maybe one of the things that, or not maybe, one of the things that I'm reflecting on is that we also are speaking a lot about misunderstanding of others in the building of students and students like her. Um, and so I don't want to jump to the solution itis and problem solving, um, but I do really like the phrase, is it a can't or is it a won't? And, you know, maybe that's something, I wonder if that's something we need to start reflecting on ourselves and maybe having people around us reflect on. Um, I don't know. And and helping all of us collectively understand the difference between a can't and a won't. Like, unfortunately, I really, really understand the can't because I lived through a really crappy trauma. And so I, I get that. But I think some of us through, and thank goodness that we all don't have crazy trauma, right? Like, thank goodness that we don't, but I think it's facilitated conversations so that we can understand it's some, you know, maybe sometimes it's won't, sure, but sometimes it really is can't. No, and the not. crazy thing is like, people love those stories. Like how many movies are there about like the teacher that went in with like one point of view and then they were changed by the students or even when Larry came in and he was talking about those kids and everyone's like, yes, like, they're like, we were engaged and we were like, amen, you know, like preach. But then like the day, the next day in the staff room, it's like, and those damn kids. And it's like, where's the disconnect? It's, I don't know. Coming off of what Sarah said is, um, actually Winter and I have had this conversation too. And if you're watching Brene Brown series, she talks about the strength of language. And I actually, I wonder, if reframing our language, um, even because we all get into that negative state, like I've been like, this is, you know, oops, that's recording, right? But, um, but um, you know, you just get that way. 
you just get that way. And I, I was wondering about like the language piece. Um, could we, could we challenge ourselves to, um, to reframe the language that we use because it, it can spiral, right? I just, as Heidi was talking, it brought up the book that we're doing for the PGP, the one you, you got for us. And that book is insanely amazing, like the perspective it takes. And I just think a lot, I think, comes down to people not actually understanding how trauma manifests in our kids and what it physically does to their brain that creates, as Sarah's coined, that beautiful, like, can't versus won't. No, it's a legitimate cannot. And so at that point in time, you need to stop and move from there because you're not going to be successful in anything else. Like, that's where you start. If you do not have a bloody understanding of trauma, you, you you can't, we can't move forward. You need to understand what it does to the kids. And I guess it comes down to, I always want to understand it through their perspective. I guess I don't have to, I just need to be there and the understanding space that it is creating something that I might not understand, but I know it's how it's manifesting in your brain. And from what I've like seen by like being part of the trauma informed practice workshops, it's that like trauma if you perceive that you had a trauma, then it was a trauma. And so like helping us as a staff understand that about our students, like you can't say like, oh, it wasn't that bad. Like if it was perceived as a trauma, then it, it's going to manifest as a trauma. Well, that's even what the book said. It didn't bring it down to the intensity of a traumatic event. It's the number. So you can have five low scale traumatic events and that still registers as a higher a score than one severely traumatic one and that shocked the daylights out of me i i had to read that over three four five times over because that just kind of highlighted what i think a lot of our kids are are dealing with multiple many and then it's not up to us to determine severity or not just like you said it's the fact that it still happened and therefore that's, that's what they're living and breathing in that moment and how they're entering our space. I'm just uh, trying to be facilitative a little bit. I've captured a few things under quick capture of next steps, but it says to be concrete. So what I've put there is, you know, maybe we need to be facilitating conversations about, um, I put helping, I mean, I bet what I should put there is, conversations about um what was that we were talking about we were talking about facilitating conversations and staff developing understanding of yeah about developing the understanding of trauma thank you and then i put i just kind of put a question about can we use different language to change um teacher mindset or our mindset. Um, and then I like this idea about perception matters, but if it's a next step, what do we do about that? Like, how do we, do we give ourselves permission? Like I said, I said to a, a group of grade seven teachers, um, but a very similar like student, like it's not your job to get her out of the bathroom. It's, I wanna give you permission to report it, but just know that you, you, don't need, you don't need to take that on, you know, like free yourself from that kind of thing. Um, like we're trying so hard to uphold rules that we self-impose. I think that language piece is so valuable there. Like just, I've only been at CMB for two years, but like last year Hats was like crazy. And then this year, and I really like, when I reflect on it, I boil it down to the one day you just gave a line, like a script in the staff meeting, like, hey buddy, I like your hat, can you take it off? And like the whole energy just just like, oh, that's all we have to say. So something as simple as giving a one sentence script could totally like flip the culture around 
maybe bathrooms, you know, like something, it, it was profound, like the simplest thing, but it made such a huge difference. Um, I'm also thinking about a uh, next step that could be concrete. Um, again, trying not to jump into solution itis because I instantly am thinking of ideas and, you know, like visioning and stuff like that. Um, but uh, not specifically necessarily, she certainly could be included, but, you know, um, identifying a few more um, students that are in similar circumstances when they're in our building. I know their home circumstances will be different, but similar circumstances um, to what they experience here and how we observe them. And just kind of actually asking the questions about um, what like if they feel safe, what part of CMB makes them feel safe and why? So that if we're visioning a place that we could support them, we would have a better idea about um, specifics as to um, what they identify as safety. So I'm not talking about like reimagining the gathering room, what would that look like, but like concrete reasons and evidence of I feel safe in this space because, for example, um, in the bathroom because adults aren't there watching me, right? Like just so we get a better sense of what, um, what they think. Were you able to um, get through the uncover protocol? First of all, is my first fifth of, fifth of five. Five is like, yes, we 100% did. And zero is like, no, we did not. And um, the other fifth of five is, did you find power in going through the protocol in that way around your students? Um, okay. So that is the beginning of us doing this together. If we were together for a full hour, it would have been a little bit more extended for a little bit more space and time. It is my hope that you all, not my hope, the request is that you take what we just did in the protocol and you do the exact same thing with the rest of your student artifacts or as many as you can. In my group, I stopped us at next steps. You see that in the last part because I want you all to get to that piece once you do all of the of the um, artifacts. Okay, so you should be able to go through that process as many times as you can, and then come together and say, "What might our next steps be?" But my push to you is to try to stay in those three main parts. Like I don't even really care about the next steps until we come back together, to be honest. But for you to really have discipline about the observation really free to have discipline around the patterns and a lot, a lot of discipline around feelings. That's usually actually the hardest part, as strange as that might sound, is to stay in your body and in your feelings. You really, really need them. So that's my hope that you all, or my, my request, I'm gonna share the homework with you. And then I just wanna give a brief moment to Winter and Aaron to honor the world that they took to witness. If you have to run, I totally understand, um, but I, I do wanna give them this moment. So. Um, the homework for you all, let me try to share this really quick. First is to finish your artifacts in your meetings together. Second is to read chapter five, specifically pages 110 to 180, I guess that is. Chapter five, please read that. Um, and then we have a small flip grid assignment for you to do in between. When I met with my kindergarten teachers, we did this together, but for the sake of time, it'll be just faster if you answer these questions on Flipgrid. So you can start to think about your, where we're gonna locate this work in your practice. So if you were at BVHM and you were thinking about student engagement, let's say, right? What I want you to do is just take a few minutes, it doesn't take that long to just think about, okay, how do I typically approach student engagement and to share that, right? How do I typically do that? What specific strategies or is there a curriculum I use or something? Cause we wanna have the context of what you're already doing. All right, so this is how I think about student engagement. Then try to think of an actual block of time, writing, math, doesn't matter what it is. If you're in the student engagement realm and break down what you've actually been doing. 
Well, first I start, you know, with a do now, which is a question that has this, right? And then the kids do this. And then I do this, try to break it down as much as you can. That's where entry points will emerge. And then I want you to just share where you struggle with the most. And again, that is, um, Ellie say, if you could let Lindy and she's in the waiting room. Um, that is usually where, again, it can be hard to be vulnerable about where you struggle, but I really want you all to push yourselves to say that. You can probably guess, for me as a teacher, I struggle with like over explaining. It can really create a problem. You know, I'm gonna be honest, I, I don't like saying it, but it's true. So that's what I want you all to do. Finish your, um, your own cover protocol, chapter five, flip grid assignment. We will give the directions for how to get, get to that. I think it, maybe we have a post-work document. In this final, just little bit of time, Winter or Aaron, who would like to go first with just witnessing um, what you all, yeah, witness. And I'll put a minute on the clock for Winter since she is already off mute. <laughs> okay. Um, I hope that I did this right. Um, what I notice is that um, as a group of all of us, uh, we were connecting with the stories that we heard. I could see nods. Um, I could see people shifting in their posture when they were watching videos and stuff. Um, that was especially evident with the story of the parent in the Abbotsford School District. So, um, but we also were connecting as a team. I felt that, um, you know, we were very respectful as a group and reflective. Um, the connection to story was really strong um, in what I sensed. And I, I really felt that as a group, um, we had a desire to, um, to do the work, right? Like um, we definitely are feeling all the feelings and we wanna do the work. Um, and I think, uh, just being aligned as a group um, was pretty evident. So. Thank you, Winter, perfect. Aaron. Let's see, I, for our team, when we were um, listening to our student and um, sort of processing it, I, I noticed that um, there were times where it was hard for us to, um, to stay in the, the type of, of thinking or the type of responses. Um, we wanted to jump to solutions pretty quickly. Um, I think there might have been some um, bit of, you know, feeling, be, being in feelings, but also feeling defensive in, at times. Um, I also want to name for our group um, that um, for each section, white women spoke first. So me, we might want to think about that in terms of moving forward of how to like, promote more equity of voice in terms of who does the first talking. Um, and I think that it's hard to stay in our emotions, but um, we need to keep doing that work. Thank you, Erin. Thank you. This is the power of witnessing, by the way. I hope you see it, just being able to feel, see, have someone else pull and hold us both accountable, but also affirm us. So thank you, Winter and Erin, for sharing. I hope you all take those reflections into your next group. I have to tell you, I'm like sweating like crazy as I get ready to get off this call because I'm so, I'm so impressed, enthralled, excited, moved, touched, all these things that you're doing this work and you're doing it after school and it, it is not lost on me what your lives are like on the day-to-day -day basis trying to run these schools and support these classrooms and do everything that you all do as human beings. So I'm so grateful. Rafa shared in the first group, uh, in the group I was in, Rafa, thank you for being the person to go through this um, openly. Who was the person who did it in your group? Who's student, who's student? Amanda, I said she's left for the night. Okay, well tell her we said thank you for being the first person to go. If you have any questions about the protocol or anything like that, just let me know and I will be willing to get on a call or whatever you need to kind of help you through it. Um, and beyond that, we're just excited to see you at the next session and see what else you all uncover. Stay in the thoughts and the feelings. <laughs>